Welcome to the Party Zone. This is Corey, and this is the Oh The Anthem Podcast. Good afternoon, everybody. It's Rob. Welcome to episode 324 of the Oh The Anthem Podcast, coming to you from the hashtag OTA LA Studios, high above the 110 freeway in downtown Los Angeles, California. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for listening on your podcatcher of choice, no matter which one it is, anchor.fm forward slash Oh The Anthem. And of course, uh, you can find Oh The Anthem at Oh The Anthem on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube.com forward slash Oh The Anthem. And we're streaming live on Twitch.tv, on Periscope, on YouTube, on Facebook, everywhere. Anywhere you want to check us out, you can find us there. And we're live all over the world. And of course, new for the last few weeks, you can join us in our Discord chat. If you want to join us there and make a comment, we'll bring it up live right here in the midst of the screen so you can see your comments on the show. Don't be confused, though. If you comment anywhere, we will we will see it. We will know about it. So. Absolutely. And this is comments from everywhere. This is comments from Facebook. We see Kent has joined us from all the way back in Maryland. Thank you for joining us, Kent. A little conversation before the show began up mm-hmm. there. But if you're commenting on Twitter, if you're commenting or Periscope or Twitch or Facebook, we're going to see it live right here. Yes, indeed. So jumping off at the top, let me grab that four year consideration splash because I don't, you know, I'm so excited. To, oh, that's right. Mm. Oh, wow. For uh, legal reasons, we can't get clearance to go shoot this thing. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Yeah. So instead, let's uh, use that questionably legal image. Uh, so great news this week, guys. Oh, and Corey and I couldn't be more excited. We tweeted about it this week. If you're not following Oh, the Anthem on Twitter, you probably missed it. But. AMC has announced that they are making a plan for reopening theaters. Now, the Corey and I get super excited about AMC for one specific reason. We are AMC. Uh, what do, what do they call A-list. that thing? Yeah. A-list. We're A-list, premium A-list subscribers, whatever A-list that is. A-list premiere, yeah. We're A-list premiere. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, what that means is we pay one flat fee and we can see all the movies we want to a month, essentially three week, three a week, which we never actually hit three yeah. a week. So AMC saying they're reopening means we get to go back to the movies. We talked a few weeks ago about how Tenant got pushed and they were going to be pushing till late July. This means that uh, AMC reopening in mid July, I think July 19th is the date that they put out, mm. uh, means that Tenant going to the end of the month will be right there. And I, here's my question for you, Corey. We have Mulan before that. I think Mulan is going to be the first big release to and open up theaters. The first big one I don't care about whatsoever. But uh, so, yeah, I was going to say what's coming out before that. And do you think they're going to try to finish run some of the stuff that opened right before the theaters ran down? Probably not. Uh, I think that some of these theater chains are a little bit upset with how some of the movies that released like straight onto VOD have uh, not respected their (laughs) theatrical window. Uh, So I doubt they're going to let them go into theaters after they've already sort of been in, in uh, homes. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there's going to be things to, to show. I imagine it's probably going to be a lot more like classic offerings in the, in the immediate term until things ramp up a little bit more. But my understanding was that uh, Staten Island, King of Staten Island. King of Staten Island was actually holding out for theaters and then basically pushed to VOD last minute. So, I don't know. Something tells me that uh, with that movie specifically, it was never going to make a lot of money in the no. box office. And I think it was probably better to just have it go on to uh, premium VOD and have people pay 20 bucks for it than it would be for it to go into theaters and make less than was expected in like an opening weekend because... If they project you to have a $10 million opening weekend and you hit eight, yep. then you're a humongous failure in a yep. lot. So with, with something so tenuous as whether or not people are going to go to the theaters and whether or not they're going to understand that uh, box office numbers are probably going to be 25% of what they were before because we're only going to be able to fill 25% of the seats at most. Yep. Uh, you know, it, it, it probably will look really bad for box office for a while. Uh, but you know that that's sort of the price you pay for having movies back. It, well, at some point, they're going to have to come back. Uh, let's uh, let's just if you guys could just hang on for a minute. Uh, do you want to do a movie night for Kingstead Island? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I want to see it. I don't know if the girls want to see it, but uh, I mean, uh, Rachel and I were talking about watching it the other day. Uh, but I didn't necessarily want to do it just because it it felt a little rich for my blood. Yeah. Like yeah. it didn't feel like I would necessarily pay twenty dollars to go see it in a theater. I would use. A list to go see it. Right. But I probably wouldn't go to like Draft House and pay 20 bucks to see King of Staten Island. Yeah. You know? 
But yeah, we'll have four of us here. And uh, I mean, if yeah. it's more people, it, it feels more worthy of, you know, like five dollars each, essentially. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't I don't care about that. And if, you know, the wayward son makes his way back from <laughs> the border, maybe we can include him. But uh, saying hi to Roberto <laughs> from all the way here. So back to the topic. AM, as Corey pointed out, AMC has said they are going to have 25 percent fill. And I think that has been a standard thus far. Um, Regal also said they were going to reopen at 25 percent. It wasn't going to be a hard ceiling, which I mean, I think that that just means we might cap it at 30 35 percent mm-hmm. but they don't i don't think that they're expecting to sell that many tickets to the to the theaters themselves um amc has said face masks are not going to be required and then they said no no wait face masks are going to be required yeah. uh so that was good uh regal had already <laughs> said face masks are going to be required uh cinemark which is by the way now that i've said <laughs> amc cinemark and regal those are the three major companies yeah. you can go see movies for uh, all saying 25%, all saying face masks. Uh, be be aware, uh, be kind to the distribution companies right now because they are, they're in perilous situation. Regal just got a $250 million debt acquisition, yeah. which will help them sort of get through this a little bit, um, but it's going to cost them in the long term. Right now, their concern is how can we not offend anybody <laughs> how can how can we be like michael jordan in the 90s yeah. and be open to anybody and not make any kind of controversial statements and just make everyone feel welcome and i feel like amc at first was just like we don't want to get into the face mask thing because then these trump people are going to come out of the woodwork and yep. be like i'm not going to go see a movie if i'm going to wear a face mask and then it seemed like the overwhelming response to it was i'm not going if there's not a face mask policy yeah. and then they were like all right that, now we'll do it and then well, I and think everyone because, else was after that. I think Regal announced their face mask policy after AMC had done it. And well, so Regal wasn't even saying mm-hmm. for sure how when their reopening was. Right. It was like everybody was waiting for someone to say it. And Cinemark, I think it said they were going to do soft, a soft open where certain theaters in certain states were going to reopen. AMC's is a nationwide reopening. Yeah. Um, and here are the rules by which we're going to open nationwide. And I... I think part of the AMC's problem also was that they weren't clear whether that face mask policy was going to be staff or guests. And a lot of people were like, well, the, the, they said staff for sure was going to wear it. I I, I see. I I thought that the whole, the whole people, the reason people were upset was like, if I, the guy sitting next to me, not having a face mask, one problem, the guy selling me the ticket, not having a face mask, different problem. And maybe it's just people like me who didn't read the story enough and weren't clear about what the rule was. I'm pretty sure I read that all the staff was going to wear face masks and they were going to have them, the separation available. The yeah. Uh, so like if you went there and you didn't have a face mask, you could get one for a dollar or something like that. And that dollar would go towards COVID-19 related. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. Um, I, you know, that that all uh, that all jives with me. I it, we're in a really weird place with the face mask thing. I I uh, I don't really get it, to be honest with you, because it, it seems like it almost feels like insurance. Would you yeah. pay would you pay twenty dollars to not get hurt this year? Like or if you did, you would get some sort of payment and like for the pain and misery of getting hurt? Like, yeah, of course you would. Like Can you can what? you recount for the listeners the example you gave me on the elevator ride up? Because I just thought that I think that is nailing it exactly right. Oh, with like people walking around the building and stuff like that? Well and and winter versus winter oh, versus yeah, like, uh you know and maybe because we're from the East Coast, but the way that winter works on the East Coast, basically, versus yeah, uh, I don't, I don't think else. people in California have an appreciation for like what you had to go through in winter time. Like, yeah. if you needed to go get the mail, under normal circumstances, you just walk out and get the mail. If it's winter time, then you have to put on the jacket, you got to put on the sweatshirt, you got to put on the the pants, you got to put on the snow pants, you got to put on the snow boots, you have to put on your gloves and your hat and everything like that. It's a 20 minute process to go outside for any reason whatsoever. So it, once you get used to that, like it sort of feels like, well, yeah, why won't I put on one layer of protection to, uh, you know, give, give me some sort of, uh, not immunity, but like, uh, the protection from it, you know, like, and that's the problem. Yeah. People in California are spoiled. They don't know. They don't know that life that, uh, going to the mail when it's freezing cold outside <laughs> life. Or the having to like stomp through like two feet of snow. Like <laughs> I, really, I don't mind doing the shorts and the t-shirt to walk out to the mail. If it's just like cold out, I can, I can deal for a couple seconds, but like when you have to like do the like forge through snow thing, like, yeah, no, fuck that. I have a really excellent picture of Corey in shorts and a sweatshirt grabbing a screen that blew off of our <laughs> apartment building in like 
ankle deep snow just like <laughs> yes i got it and it's uh it's a good picture i'll try to find that picture. that was that was funny we were i think we were just like looking at the window we we're just like oh, that sounds weird and then all of a sudden just <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was uh the snowpocalypse 2000 and <laughs> it felt like uh the uh uh <laughs> when SWAT like blows a door. <laughs> yeah, that's basically what it was. Yeah. Uh, what's, anyway. that, what's that commotion out there? Bam. Mm, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, speaking of a commotion, Corey, I think that uh, there was a little bit of a commotion with the Supreme court this week. Wasn't there? Uh, I don't know if I would say a commotion, but there was certainly something. Um, so uh, the Supreme court is in session. Uh, they just ruled last week on uh, protections for trans and gay uh, uh, workers uh, that angered Trump. And uh, this week, uh, DACA was on the agenda. And in a 5-4 decision with uh, Roberts siding with the liberal justices, uh, they argued that the uh, Trump DACA recension is not legal and that uh, it has to be overturned. And I would say that this is a big win for dreamers and everyone who uh, uh, has been on their plight. But uh, I wouldn't get super comfortable with this one because it basically how Roberts uh, justified how he voted there was that the Trump administration did not follow the law properly when they rescinded it and that it's not a moral judgment. It's just merely a whether or not they followed the exact framework that they needed to do to overturn this and they didn't. And this so, is the this is the first one of those if you come back with the bill, if you come back with the thing that deports all these people who've known no country other than America, yeah. then I'm going to allow it to pass but only as long as it fra- is within the legal framework that we need it to be. And I think that is the uh that's the frustrating part because the thing I hear most from the right wingers are about liberal judges legislating from the bench, which, you know, I, I, whether you agree with it or not, sometimes it's necessary because the legislature just doesn't do it. And, Mm. um, Brown versus board of education was finally the court saying, if you're not going to do anything about this, we're going to have to say, this is illegal. Go to an alternative. And if you can't figure it out, we'll figure it out. Um, but the conservative judges do the opposite. But it's almost as damaging where they say, listen, we can't side with you this time, but here's a 12 point plan. And if you bring me this 12 point plan, I'll agree with you next time. Now, and one of the things I think is weird, though, uh, just basically on this topic alone, not this topic, but uh, Roberts alone Mm -hmm. is giving it some thought while you were talking. I don't know that if it was just a moral call that the new Roberts, this new guy who we weren't expecting at all, doesn't make a moral call. I think this was a way of him hedging a bet and being like, now, I know you saw me rule on the other thing and it seemed weird, but this thing is because you didn't do it right. And then if they bring it back, maybe he's going to be like, well, yeah, kids in cages. I'm not down with that. Yeah. So I'm also going to overrule you on the fact of morality. And yeah. uh, maybe it's a way of like calling out all evil people and being like, hey, um, this is, look at all the evil people who voted for this. We're still going to strike it down, but now you know. Well, I mean, like, you know, at, at the end of the day, what you want from a judge if you're if you're trying to get the fairest, most honest judges you can, what you're looking for is somebody who is going to apply the law uh, and apply the law from the Constitution mostly. Like, you know, like everything, all, all our laws are based somewhat on the Constitution before it. So if there's something that leads from the Constitution to this moment, then you're going to go through all those steps to get to there. Uh but at the end, you want somebody who's going to be fair, somebody who who examines all the facts and tries to judge based off of whether whether or not uh, it should go or not. You know, and I I feel like Roberts at this point is more concerned about doing something that might be politically charged that is against how he feels the law should be read. Like he is going to he will he will go to the right on issues if it's a. 50 50 call Mm -hmm. but if there's a clear violation of the law somewhere along the way or violation of how the law should be uh instituted then he he has no choice you you, it's like uh you know if if crucial evidence is thrown out by the judge because it was illegally obtained like what do you mean to do yeah (laughs) he clearly murdered her based off this conversation that you got 
of her recording him in a two-party consent state. I'm sorry. Legally, I cannot allow this piece of evidence into the courtroom. Yeah. I agree that on that tape, he said, I'm going to kill you when I got home. And later when he got home, she was dead. But But unfortunately, (laughs) there's nothing I can do about the law. Like, Well, and I think there's also uh, in the pre-show we were discussing about how some justices tend to, as they, they stay on the bench for longer, think more about their place in history and they come in on the they come in on the court like Kavanaugh has, just full of piss and vinegar, and like I'm a conservative, and this is how I'm gonna rule. And then some of them, Scalia isn't one, Ginsburg isn't one. On the other side, mm-hmm. some of them tend to move towards the middle and just be like, I don't want to be on the wrong side of history on something here. Now, I don't think Ginsburg has to worry about that because generally she's the buffer trying to keep us out of fascism. But <laughs> um, for Roberts. I wonder if there is a little bit of, I don't want to be on the wrong side of history 20 years from now, because by the way, and uh, funny thing in the, uh, if you guys were here for the wait screen, we do a wait screen before we start the show and, and it runs with some old episodes. I realize there's a hundred percent chance we talked about this when he was nominated less than five years ago, but he's a 40 year old. He was nominated for the court at 40. Yeah. He's going to be there a long time. And Part of me, I think, hopes that he's thinking about 20 years from now, if I'm still sitting on this bench, do I want the, that court then? Robert, Roberts was in Bush, though, right? Yeah. No. So it would have been more than, it would have been Oh, he was at the end of Bush. He was at the end of Bush, right? No, 2008. Was it 2008, 2007? Well, 2000, yeah, I mean, 2008 would have been when Bush was going out. Yeah. I think it would have had to have been 2007. Wow, what were we talking about then? I well, I mean, Roberts. we've talked about Gorsuch. We've talked about Kavanaugh. Maybe it was uh, during the discussion of... Uh, Garland. Garland. Yeah. Because I feel like Roberts came in at the end of Bush. Well, I mean, then... like, any time we talk about the court, there's a, a certain degree of Roberts who talk about yeah. because he's the he's the uh, Lisa Murkowski of the court at the moment. Like, he, a guy he goes wherever he wants. Like Nominated to chief justice instead of having someone on the court move to chief justice and right. nominate a new associate. Uh Yeah, I guess he's been there for a while. So, oh, wow, he's in his 50s now. But nonetheless, um, he's still going to be there for a long time. I I just, uh, for me, it it just seems weird that you don't think about your place in history at all when you get to this place. Because it's not like, you know, if you're an NBA player, you think about your place in history at a certain point. If you've played long enough and you're well-known enough, LeBron James at this point is starting to think about, like, beyond the basketball accomplishments, what am I going to be remembered for? So, you know, that's, a, you know, not that he doesn't care about these issues, but it's why he's leading so much on like George Floyd and race, racial issues and stuff like that, because he sees a moment where he can make some s- substantial change and he can be remembered more for this in association with a great basketball career mm-hmm. than he would be known if he was just a great basketball player. Uh, and there's more cachet in him being known as a... Uh, somebody who fought for rights and not just played the game, right? There's there's a big difference, though. Uh, he's one of 10,000 people who've played in the NBA yeah. as opposed to one of nine that are on the court at any given point in time. And uh, although the next great player may be coming up as he's going out, for instance, Rehnquist uh, yeah. was nominated in the late or mid-70s. I think Nixon nominated Rehnquist as mm-hmm. an associate justice. Reagan moved him up to chief justice. He was on the court long enough that he wrote the minority opinion on a case that then came up for review while he was still on the court and basically had a bunch of new people sitting next to him who said, wow, this is a real shitty opinion. <laughs> and that's part of the realizing like Roberts at 45 right. having to be like, I don't want 20 years from now for this to come back and be like, dude, what were you thinking? Yeah. Like kids in cages is okay. And Whatever it takes to get you to the right side of the issue, you move there just so 20 years from now, you're not talking about it again. I mean, uh, I, thinking back, you know, and I'm not like some scholar on the Supreme Court, so I'm sure I'm missing something. I'm sure there's some person who's uh, yelling at their <laughs> podcatcher of choice right now going, you idiot, you forgot about this. But uh, I mean, like for the most part, part, I feel like Roberts is is pretty good on the law. Yeah. And he, he finds his decisions and what makes the most sense legally. He doesn't seem to freelance on opinion that much. Uh, There certainly have, like we talked about, there's certainly been 50-50 calls where it feels like he leans more to ideology than law, but that's when 
you're trying to split a baby of some kind, you know, and like it, your natural inclination is going to be what leads the day to an extent. Well, uh, the the white court though, the Justice White was uh, the, the they've all been white courts. <laughs> The chief justice during the uh, late 50s and early 60s, uh, uh, I said Brown versus Board of Education. That was the one of the first decisions for the for the white court with him as chief justice. And basically what uh, his policy was, was to figure out his decision and then work his way back on the law and yeah. figure out how do I justify this place we need to go, legally speaking. And I don't know that Roberts isn't starting to do that, too. Where he's like, this is where I want to be. Now, how do I work my way from where the problem of the law is to get there? I think Roberts on some of these issues, like because when when DACA came up with Obama in court, where they were trying to uh, argue it on, uh, they argued it all the way to the Supreme Court and they upheld that the Obama administration was within their rights to do this. Uh, And I think their their argument, the win there was basically like, uh, we have no reason to overturn it, but if you pass a law, then <laughs> there's nothing we can really do about yeah. it. Uh, and then they never bothered with the law part because they were worried about any law they write to counteract this would have some sort of institution in it that would not be able to be defended in court. Because yes. at a certain point when people were arguing DACA uh, from the right it, in, it, in the case, it, it, it was hard to not make it some sort of mention of sort of an inherent racism that Latin people American need to go country. back to their countries. Like, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and Latin American countries, even yeah. though there are DACA recipients who are from all over the world. Right. But it doesn't matter because the argument Some comes down to... Some seven-year-old from Oslo who's only known this country. Like, yeah. yeah. But it doesn't matter because to the right, it's about Mexicans, Central Americans, and South Americans coming up over the board. Right. And how do you make a law that's like, listen, the guy from Oslo, totally cool. We want him to stay. It's... The we can't say brown people. Uh, yeah. It's the uh, non whites. Is that cool? Can we say non whites? No. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. How do I make this argument <laughs> in a way that, that isn't uh, inherently help me? Yeah. Help <laughs> me. Uh, but yeah. So uh, and, and I, I think the problem is too. We're not. This is not a hot take, but it's certainly very early in a group that gives very few hints several times a year. So like this is two of maybe four or five decisions they'll give and then big break and then they'll hear some more cases and then October we'll get some more stuff. Yeah. And it's like you get these little hints of things and then we could come back to Fuhrer Roberts in October. We don't know. Right. Um, and it could just be like, um, yo, Trump really like his hair. Eh, I'm going to rule for the uh, for the administration. I mean, it, Roberts isn't wrong. <laughs> to to rule the way he did. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it seems that the the conservative justices who voted on the uh, dis- uh, dissent, uh, the four uh, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, uh, the usual damn, suspects, the usual suspects. <laughs> uh, except Gorsuch had his, had his week last, last week. So I guess we shouldn't necessarily run. Yeah, into the Asian. I guess. Uh, no, but I mean like, uh, they all seem to be buying the line. Robert seems to be uh, the one who's being swayed on the law. That that's our that's our kind of defining moment here, I think. And the good news, there's not much new good news that in the Trump administration, <laughs> but the good news if you if you're uh if you care about issues like this is apparently they're so bad at the law <laughs> and they don't know how to write it that it it just it's just bound for failure. Yeah. It's one of those, if it gets to the high court, it's going to fail because no adult with a law degree <laughs> at any point was involved in putting this together. It's funny because, uh, Trump I don't know if, writing a declaration on a napkin does not do it for Roberts. You know, it, it, I don't know if it was last week or it was the week before where we talked about civil rights act and Lyndon Johnson spending a lifetime learning how to write legislation and right. being like, Listen, if you don't want to get challenged, this is what we got to cover. Here's the it's a pain, but here are the 90 bases that we have to get through to make sure it will survive judicial review. And they did. And it took a long time, but they got it done. And then basically what we have now is a guy doing fiat where he's just like, I want to stop doing this. And they're like, OK, uh, law or at, executive action. At and, the end of the day, uh, <laughs> people who are really talented and good at the law 
want to continue doing it in some way or fashion. And if you're a politician who is interested in going in it that way, Mm -hmm. you know, 15 of the brightest legal minds of our coming generation are stocked in Nancy Pelosi's office right now. Yes. Getting paid nowhere near what lawyers are supposed to get paid, basically getting paid like college students to read and rewrite laws. Uh, This is not something they do because uh, they like punishment. They know that if they eat shit for a little while in Pelosi's office, then it's going to open them up for the opportunity to maybe run for office in the future. Mm -hmm. And their law degree is going to help making them a more attractive politician when they run. (laughs) It helps on them. It helps you. It helps move you along. Right. Also, Uh, if you uh, work in public service for 10 years, they can forgive your uh, student loans, although (laughs) Trump has basically closed that program down. So basically you can get it. You can get it done as long as you follow every single rule perfectly. And there's going to be rules that they tell you about, like in the middle of the night. It's it's the send uh, you an email at 3 a.m. Be like, respond to this by 330 or else your loans are not. (laughs) It's uh, if you are black and trying to (laughs) register to vote in. Mm, Alabama. Alabama in 1955. <laughs> you walk up there, you don't know what they're gonna ask you, and you gotta have the right answer. You just know so. you're gonna come back tomorrow and stand in a line. Yeah. So that name all 59 <laughs> courts, uh, judges of the circuit court. Like, what? Why would I possibly have to <laughs> fail? Do you oh, know right. this? <laughs> okay. Yeah, honestly, it's like just start naming people. That guy doesn't know who they are. No, I mean, if if you wanna if you wanna find uh, really brilliant legal minds. Uh, the next generation. You're going to find them working for uh, congressmen and senators. You're going to find them clerking for justices. That's a huge one. If you can clerk for, you know, Roberts, mm-hmm. then you can basically write your ticket once yep. you're not uh, in the helping him anymore. Uh, and uh, honestly, I don't think people who have law degrees are very interested in working for Trump because it's just not going. There's nobody there who seems to be writing like brilliant laws. And we should know this because <laughs> Bill Barr, who is the head of the Justice Department, the top lawyer in the country, yeah. doesn't understand how like the, fucking, the basics of how his department is run. Uh, did, you, did you see the, the whole constitutional crisis we had in, in the Southern District of New York? Yeah, uh, the guy found out he was fired by a tweet and... Uh... <laughs> So it's so much better than that. I'm going to give I'll, I'll give it a quick play by play. OK. Uh, essentially, what happened was uh, I can't remember the uh, Berman. I think it is. Is the some of the B. That's the only yeah. thing. And that's why I get confused because I'm like, oh, it's Barr and and Burham. Yeah, I, 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 I haven't remembered the, the, the U.S. attorney in New York. <laughs> it's just not on the top of my list. Uh, Berman and Barr met on uh, Friday and basically Barr was making him an offer to uh, move up to be the head of the civil rights division of the uh, Department of Justice. And uh, Berman was like, oh, that's nice. And apparently Barr thought that was an agreement that he was going to resign and move up to be the head of this department and the Department of Justice. Uh, And when Barr, Barr said he's uh, offered to resign and Berman replied with, no, I haven't. <laughs> You're I'm not going to resign. You're going to have to fire me. And then uh, word came out that Trump fired Berman, which he's legally allowed to do. Yes. And then right before he gets on the plane to go to his Oklahoma rally, a reporter asks him, why did you fire the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York? And Trump's like, I didn't have anything to do with that. That was all Bill Barr. <laughs> And now it was a constitutional crisis because hmm. who actually fired him? And because by the way, Barr doesn't have the authority no, to fire him. Does not under yes. any circumstances have yes. the ability to fire him. Uh, the good news, I guess, in that in this game of chicken that was happening, is that because the uh, U.S. attorney has to be uh, confirmed, and it only triggers a confirmation if he resigns yes. because he was fired the number two moves up yeah and apparently she's just as good as not as him so we're it seems like there's going to be a nice uh continuation of power there but like, oh, hasn't he said he's not giving up the office he said he was not going to give it up unless the president fired him and then the president fired him and oh, then he was okay. just like i'm away for clarification before i pack up my desk yeah yeah i would <laughs> If you don't mind, I'm just going to hang out here for a little while. Just make sure I'm still fired. 
By the way, um, to everyone who listened to me four years ago and voted for Trump, because well, I don't vote. I, why would you <laughs> listen to me? Um, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. That's all I can say. I, I don't know what else, what else you want at this point. Um, but I was going to say, do you know where you can't find scrappy lawyers who are just digging in and using that legal education? No, where? Uh, you can't find them at OtheAnthem.com, that's for sure. Uh, and you can't find them at Anthem uh, on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or anywhere. Uh, because although I might be a lawyer, uh, I'm not scrappy and I'm not using my law degree. So uh, the other place you're not going to be able to find them is in police departments all over the country. Probably a place you should have a lawyer or two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> At least somebody casually aware of the law. Yeah, not somebody who took uh, six months of training, five months of which was focused on guns and how to <laughs> shoot a gun. Um, but so I, I mentioned in our like little intro bit, but uh, Corey, I, I, there's a virus going around the country. Are you aware of this? Yeah, I mean, we're in a pandemic. No, no, oh, not, not that, that one. one. A no. new one? A new one. And, oh, my uh, God. We're, I, I feel bad because I feel like I've been proven wrong. Uh, I said that uh, to be a police officer was a job, but clearly there must be something akin in all of them because they all seem to be getting the flu all at the same time while the rest of us are just fine. Have, they, weird. have they been talking about this flu? Or, I mean, I mean they've there... been tweeting about it and <laughs> you know, they're not, uh, nobody's working. They're apparently well enough. It's not life-threatening because you're well enough that you can TikTok and tweet and yeah. be on Facebook. Uh, but cry you about an work. egg McMuffin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can pretend to be poisoned. Although that lady wasn't actually a cop. She was a security guard. Uh, you can pretend to be poisoned. <laughs> she, uh, by stick -tick. she actually is a, a sheriff department, but she had claimed, I guess in the video that she was, uh, like local police or something. Oh, see, I, I remember I, we had our conversation about how sheriffs and police yeah. are different. No, no, she's it, like, but I guess she there was, was a in lot the uniform of a private, uh, there was a lot of back and forth about yeah. what what her deal was, but uh, she's crazy. That's what her yeah. deal is. Yeah, uh, you don't give crazy people guns, <laughs> but uh, it's America, so what are you gonna do? Apparently, she's a sheriff of some kind. Not a. She's like a uh, deputy sheriff. No, what's the one below that? Like the no it, like, deputy is all they get, right? Is that <laughs> like uh, what would you give like a high school student who wants to be a deputy reserve <laughs> deputy <laughs> or a reserve sheriff? You're a sheriff deputy explorist. <laughs> like, <laughs> Oh, uh, uh, like uh, when uh, the sheriff goes down to the uh, the little building and behind the school, and everybody gets a badge. Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> What's the? Uh, you remember not another teen movie? Yes. Uh, oh no, it wasn't not another teen. What? Fuck, it, what was the one with the? Uh, uh, it was the scream. Uh, yeah, yeah, spoof. yeah. Uh, Scary movie. Doofy. Yeah, Doofy. Officer Doofy. Yeah, th she was basically Doofy. <laughs> whatever, whatever accommodation they gave Doofy. I was cleaning my room. <laughs> so, uh, I come from my egg McBuffin. <laughs> that was 100%. By the way, a movie which would not get made today. No. Just based on that voice alone. <laughs> and wait, no, David Arquette is in the actual He was in movie. Scream, yeah. So it's a it was dude like who a, looked a lot like David Arquette. It was an Arquette, Arquette lookalike. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. But it could be a role that David Arquette would actually play. I don't know. I, I wonder what the line is on that one because... I mean, like, it was clearly that he was... I mean, if you watched all the way to the end of the movie, spoiler alert. I'm sorry. I, spoiler <laughs> I don't know if I'm ruining scary movie for somebody. But it turns out he was just putting on an act. It was to, the um, uh, uh, Usual Suspects. Uh, God, what is the guy's name from Usual Suspects? Um, oh, my God. Uh, I don't know what it, Kevin Spacey. Yeah. Also... Been not in scary movie. Hey, all, no, all of these uh, people have been me too. But so Kaiser Sose, he Kaiser Sose. Uh, <laughs> um, Doofy was Kaiser Sose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was acting dumb to so, to be this is unassuming. Like so many levels. But if you, <laughs> if you guys, uh, spoiler alert for Usual Suspects from 1996, <laughs> um, Kevin Spacey plays a mentally challenged guy, and then as he walks out of the police station, like he has this limp. And like the limp goes away and then he like throws some shades on and jumps into a car and you're like, he's Kaiser Sose. <laughs> uh, and then Doofy was basically Kaiser Sose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Playing the Too Cool for School by Fountains of Wayne at the end. That's right. Yeah. Oh, Fountains of Wayne. Oh, a lot of deep pulls. A lot of deep <laughs> pulls from the late 90s. By the way, uh, most of the people I work for or work with yeah. were not born when that movie came out. So, <laughs> so how does old. that make you feel? Oh, so right. old. 
Uh, but anyway, back to the topic, which is uh, cops are getting the blue flu. Yeah. And um, if not, just outright <laughs> quitting. In case people don't know, uh, we were just joking about them being actually sick. Yes. This is This is them uh, calling in sick because they don't want to go to work because... Uh, they're upset with how they're treated. And also because they apparently don't, you know, read a newspaper when like New York blue flued out and crime, crime went, went down, down. Yeah. and the city was very, much more peaceful and Baltimore police blue flued out and crime went down and things were a lot more peaceful. <laughs> Except for the police. Well, Except yeah, for the gun trace task force. They were, they were, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> they were the only ones working. <laughs> I seem, I seem to remember at some point along the way, like, Kevin Davis was like, the gun trace task force, the only one who's doing anything in this department. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the more my. you know. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, oh, <laughs> but uh, I, I, we kind of got into a discussion prior to the show just about, like... Uh, so uh, I have always been a defender of unions, and I, I get put in a weird position when we talk about police unions and teacher unions because... It seems like too often, and I'm, I'm glad this week I thought about Michael A. Wood and his first mm. appearance on uh, Joe Rogan, where basically he said, I figured this union who defends so many terrible cops would come to my defense right? because I did the right thing, but crickets, and they just let me be fired. And I think that's where I get upset because I am almost okay with you defending bad members of your union so long as you have as much boisterous noise to defend the good ones in your union when they do something that people don't like and they try to get fired to. But the cops don't do that. And teachers don't do that. I, so the, the position we're in right now with like the blue flu in Atlanta and stuff like that yeah. is they're upset with how things went in. Uh, God damn it. Blanking on the name. Uh, the Wendy's. No, 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 no. The Wendy's shooting. Or the guy who was sleeping in his car. Oh, Raymond just Abbott. Brooks. Yes, Rashad Brooks. Rashad Brooks. Rashad Sorry. Brooks. Um, I I always don't want to get a name wrong, so I do that thing where I like have like Brooks in my head, and yeah. I'm just like, what the By fuck the way, is it? Maybe it's a bit of a problem because we can't remember which black guy shot by police. The one we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, anywho. By the way, uh, if this th was in Norway, we would be like, oh, you know that guy, the one guy in the last four years that <laughs> yeah. was killed by police. Yeah, let's talk about that guy. We know all the names of the people who were shot by police in Norway. The uh, so essentially what the Atlanta Police Department and the members of the union more so are upset about is that uh, the proper procedure wasn't followed in uh, pressing charges against the cop. Yeah. Who uh, is being charged with murder in this case. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, whether you know, depend, uh, cops are a dangerous subject right now. But part of the situation we're in right now is that these contracts and union rights that have been written into law essentially are going to be protected until it's time to renegotiate. In a lot of cases, there's not going to be a lot of unilateral movement that's going to be able to be made to change how procedures go. Except this is a good example. So Fulton County mm -hmm. it holds the court. So the Fulton County District Attorney is the one who charged the cop. Right. The CBA is with who? Atlanta. The city of Atlanta. Oh. And what we've been under forever is the understanding that Fulton County will honor the Atlanta's, terms of the yeah. CBA that was agreed upon with Atlanta. And now they're just not. They're like... I don't care what your CBA with Atlanta. Okay, so go to the Atlanta DA. Oh, I'm sorry. They don't have a court in Atlanta? Oh, well, who cares? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, you should have negotiated with Fulton County if you wanted something in there about not charging people. Same thing's happening in Minneapolis. Minneapolis City has the police, but the county, whatever the county is for Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, has the... Yeah, it's, it's for both of them. I know that. Yeah, but Minneapolis has a police force. St. Yeah. Paul has a police force. County is both of them. Right. Um, just like NYPD is the entire city, but it's in Kings County, Queens County, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Manhattan, and Staten Island. Yeah. No, Kings County is Brooklyn, the Bronx. Yeah. And, uh, and Staten Island. Yeah. So they're in the opposite where it's like one police force, many Five different counties, court jurisdictions. Yeah. <laughs> and so it, it, again, we just honor, we've traditionally, because we're all on the same side, Fulton County DA works with the police in Atlanta and the, the Fulton County sheriff. Yeah. We honor the agreements, but now they're just saying, no, what I'm under no uh, obligation to do that. 
I'm not I'm not saying that they have to be kind to the agreement that they signed or something like that, but if you were if you worked at an ice cream shop and the rules changed on you, you would be understandably upset. Like if uh, if you all mean, of a sudden I'm not saying uh, you know uh, uh, and don't make it an example of somebody being killed. No, I'm just no, saying no, no. like if you just are a a 18 year old who has a job at an ice cream shop and uh, they say you can use your phone when there's no customers in the store, but you have to go out of sight. I don't yeah. want people walking into the store seeing you on your phone. Cool. If there's no customers, I'm going to stand right around the corner, look to make sure people aren't coming in, and yes, just no. shoot off a qu- yeah. quick text. Uh, if you come in the next day and the boss fires you, that I told you never to be on that phone, you're fired, get out of here, then it would be understandable and justifiable if you were upset about that or your coworkers were upset about that, and maybe there was some sort of planned action if it was that big of a deal. What uh, if you were 18 and worked in an a ice cream shop and you were accused of murder and they took you into an interrogation room and the cop who was sitting there said, listen, if you just admit, you know, tell me what happened, I can get you a good deal with the uh, prosecutor, yeah. which he absolutely cannot do. Right. So you talk to the cop and implicate yourself as an accessory before the fact or after the fact. And yeah. then uh, he's like, oh, well, tough luck, buddy. Uh, I'm not well, I would tell I would tell that cop. Uh, yeah, we can do that as soon as my lawyer is here. Well, and that is. By the way, absolutely what you should do whenever any comp asks you any questions, you should have two responses. Am I being detained? If the answer is no, walk away. If the answer is yes, then you say, I'm not going to answer any questions until my lawyer is present. That's it. And then they're going to be like, hey, buddy, uh, I know you've been here a while. Can we get you some food? Don't answer. Because as soon as you start a conversation with them, they can start asking you questions again. As long as you are acknowledging them. I mean, you can answer as long as it is irrelevant to anything that they would bring up in court Except as long as as long as if they start talking about anything else you say is my lawyer here yet or something of that here's the problem and thank you scotus <laughs> if they say hey buddy we're gonna get dinner do you want something and you say yeah grab me a cheeseburger that means essentially they can start asking you questions again and if you're tired because you've been there for 18 hours and you're hungry because they haven't fed you and maybe you haven't had water or anything else then they start asking you other questions like, hey, you want us to call your mom? And, you know, I know you're 18, but you want us to call your mom and, f- and let her know where you are. Or you have a girl somewhere we can talk to. Yeah. And just like, yeah, it's going to be a shame if they don't see you very long. Yeah, I'd really, you're a nice kid. I'd really like to help you out because you open the door by responding to them. Yeah. So your proper response should be, hey, we're going to get some, do you get some food? Do you want anything? You should just say, where's my lawyer? That's it. Yeah. The only words out of your, lo- your mouth should be, where's my lawyer? Lawyer. <laughs> Miranda, any of those things. Yeah. Because otherwise you reopen the door. Thank you. Uh, Rehnquist Court, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Call back to the Rehnquist Court. Yeah. Uh, but so uh, my, my point of my the uh, kind of the thing I was saying is just that cops lie to people all the time. And it is what it is. They, they try and pull tricks to, to get people arrested on a daily basis. Yep. And yeah. now you are crying foul because... Someone is not abiding by the verbal agreement mm-hmm. that you reached with them. And not even that, kind of just an understood agreement. All right. A baseball unspoken rule, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> Guess you should have had your your uh, union negotiating with Fulton County as a party to this CBA. Yeah. Otherwise, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, we said we wouldn't prosecute you, but that doesn't mean we can't prosecute you. I don't know what you're talking about. They, right. You said you couldn't. Char- you would get, were put in a word with the DA. That's part not your of, power. But you know, again and again, this uh, this is not meant to be a defense of cops in any sort of way. But the uh, the the major issue that we're going to have for the foreseeable future with any kind of protest or any kind of movement that uh, this, a citizenry tries to make on the way the police uh, work in the side of community is largely going to be dependent on how we renegotiate the rules yes. between you know, whatever entity and the cops. Uh, and that's not the type of thing you can just necessarily throw out the agreement you have. And there's going to be little things about it. Uh, some of these things are meant to uh, delay. I mean, like negotiate <laughs> things are negotiated to be delayed. I think there was a thing in Baltimore city where, uh, cause it happened with uh, Freddie Gray, where you couldn't interview the officers for a month yep. or something like that. They yep. charged them before they even interviewed anybody associated with it. Because but the cops had to have like a month where they couldn't be talked to by anybody. Yes. And then that after a month, it was only a 
police rep, but there would be no recording and it would only be an informal conversation, basically with the same sort of like uh, uh, queen for a day sort of rules. Mm hmm. But nothing out of that conversation would come out. But basically, a guy would come out and being like, mm. "We're gonna." <laughs> it's basically a big hypothetical. Yeah. Let's just hypothetically say this situation happened, and right. then you tell them hypothetically what happened, and they come out with the like, "Yeah, we should probably look into this a little more," or more likely the, uh, "It's no big deal." We'll we might fine. have IA look at this, yeah. but uh, that's as far as it goes. Yeah. Um. I. I if you. If you worked at a place and the rules changed on you suddenly you would feel uh understandably upset about that uh if your work was doing something horrible and <laughs> needed to have rules changed automatically then you would think that uh, i mean this is the same thing that happened with the auto workers to an extent yep. yeah. like the auto you know the, there were all these stories about uh, some guy get paid $87,000 a year and all he does is sleep in the office and we can't fire him because he's part of the union and, you know, every Camaro you buy is $10,000 more expensive because we have guy. 200 of those guys yeah. and stuff like that. Um, you know, the guy who had the sweet, cushy gig sleeping and making $87,000 was like, hey, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> we have to we have to discuss this before we change it. Yeah. Uh, I feel bad for him because he felt like, you know, he was he had an agreement and then it got pulled away from him. But I don't feel bad for him because he was a louse and should, should have been fired a long time ago. Like there's there's two different sides to a to a problem here. You know, there's there's multiple ways that we have to approach this. And one of the one of the so the problem is that uh, in negotiation, if there's a lot of things that come up like uh, situations like this where they're sort of foregoing. Uh, casual understandings they've had with Atlanta and going Fulton instead to charge them, they're going to start making a bigger deal out about who can yeah. charge them and stuff. Yeah. That will that will not go into a oh we're going to give up more rights because you charged us now. It's going to go into a bigger fight about what kind of jurisdiction Fulton County has over proceedings and, and so on and so forth. That leads to another thing. So, so Atlanta is more controversial because. There is a, uh, a, br a rule broken, whether it was written rule or not. Yeah. There are other places where the blue flu is coming out only because the city or the county or the state is talking about defunding the police department. Right. And basically they are holding it, having a tantrum and just like calling out and being like, well, if you don't appreciate us and you want to take our money away, well, we're just not going to do our job. It's another protection of the job, by the way, too. Just the idea that you could do this because if... <laughs> if I worked at if I worked at a for hire restaurant or something like that, like <laughs> uh, at will employment McDonald's. And, yeah. If I worked at McDonald's and 10 of my employees decided that they were just going to not show up because they wanted to make some sort of point. Yep. I'm going to show you 10 fired people <laughs> like immediately. I got a stack of resumes over there. <laughs> all of them are just as bad yeah. as yours. All right. And I can get all those. You guys are here tomorrow. not special, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, it, you know, so but by the way, that is why it's so hard to organize McDonald's and, and right. Ralph's and those places, because literally people are so desperate for work that, I mean, there have been times in my life where if I had gotten called and somebody said, can you be here at four? I would have been like, it's two 30. I'm an hour away. Yes. I can absolutely be there at four. Uh, you got the job. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. I'll be there. I'll see you. So they could have fired their entire staff. And closed for lunch and then reopened later in the afternoon. For dinner, yeah. Uh, police departments don't work like that. No. And <laughs> they have legal protections that if they call out sick, that uh, they they are not going to get punished for that. Although, ironically, uh, McDonald's police departments probably just as proficient with firearms. So it's one of those <laughs> things, you know. We should give drive through people guns. <laughs> That's how we'll fix it. If so, they see any crime, they'll just stick out and just like, pew, 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 pew. <laughs> but wait, wait, remember what Biden said, shoot him in the leg, not in the chest. That's what we got to do. Oh, Jesus uh, so we got Christ. two other news things. I just want to like lightning round through so we can get to the rest of the show. Cause we were already going a little long. Um, something that kind of came out and I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want you to hot take it, but Kay. it just came out today. So feel free not to comment if you don't want to. No but, comment. <laughs> uh, just that uh, there are paramedics. There are, uh, support staff at hospitals that have been doing double shifts since the COVID pandemic began. Yes. There are Ralph workers who have been working double shifts since the pandemic began. These folks are going out and going to work while the rest of us got to stay home 
working our telecommuting jobs or just not going out into the world. Yeah. And one of the stories that came out was there was a paramedic, I think it was DC, who was working uh, 14 hours, which is a double for him, and then driving Uber several hours after his shift because he couldn't pay his rent yeah. on double shift paramedic uh, pay. And I, he had a kid or two kids. I, I don't remember all of the details, but it's just like, there is no world in my mind where that makes sense. That you are out working as a paramedic in a coronavirus world doing double shifts and you should still have to go drive Uber afterward to make ends meet. I think that there are uh, misunderstandings about what uh, is what is value exactly. So with a police department, you hear something like, you know, LAPD costs one point eight billion dollars a year. Right. Like or that's what that's what they were proposed yeah. for before Garcetti cut the old budget down. Um, and they cut one hundred fifty million out. But yeah. yeah, it's still a billion dollars being spent on the police. But uh, one point six billion, actually. Yes. No, no, no. He cut the the earlier amount. So it was like one point two before. So now it's just one point oh five or whatever. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. All right. Well, sure. Yeah. Uh, big cut. <laughs> well, they're not authorizing any more overtime, so I don't know what to tell you. By the way, uh, just so you, for those who have trouble with big numbers, yeah. uh, a million seconds is 11 days. A billion seconds is 31 years. <laughs> that is the we're talking about 31 years of seconds of dollars. That is how much is being spent. I was like the uh, somebody. uh there was a, a fake Twitter account for like LAPD parody account or something like yeah. that. And it's just like people think one point eight billion dollars is a lot of money. But then you think about it and it's only thirty two point eight million dollars a day. <laughs> it's just like, holy shit, we're spending more Christ. per day on the police department than we are for homelessness. I don't know, like big issue, anything like there's there's a ton I'm of pretty sure that we spend five million a year on homelessness in you in uh, L.A. I think I think they'll argue that they spent a hundred million dollars or something like that, but that'll yeah. be five million from the city plus charitable plus, you know, an extra bond measure that was passed by the state and which theoretically is available for homelessness, but is also available for schools and also to buy bulletproof vests for cops. So right. But I'm saying it was where that money got spent. I can't tell you. The problem is that at the end of the day, like <laughs> If you ask Garcetti a question, he's just like, no, we spent $100 million on the homeless. I'm just like, well, I guess I'm going to spend the next two and a half weeks looking at the entire budget and figuring Figure this shit out. Like, yeah. yeah. Like at a certain point, you have to take people on their word because I'm not going to do that. Like, By the way, this is why local newspaper reporting is so important. Yeah. I, I mean, going back to Baltimore, the Baltimore Brew, I didn't realize how much I missed them. Yeah. But they are doing really good in-depth reporting where they're like, hey, you know how they said this? Not true at all. Here's the facts. And yeah. I'm like, oh, bless you so much. <laughs> uh, and Matt Pierce, uh, who is a reporter with, or was, I don't know if he still works there, at the LA Times, basically has made it his uh, his little thing to be like, all right, so but the mayor said a lot of things. Is that a scream? <laughs> no, that was a that was a almost car accident. Oh, okay. I was uh, waiting for the boom. <laughs> Uh, Matt Pierce will say like, uh, okay, so the mayor, the mayor spoke for 30 minutes. I picked out one thing. Here's why he lied. And it's just like, I went really in depth and found all the details. Um, so support local news reporting, by the way. Be yeah. like Corey, who has a, uh, do you still have the subscription to the Baltimore Sun that you're paying for? Oh, no, they wouldn't take your money. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did at the end of the day have to uh, uh, figure out a way to get to the Baltimore Sun because I have a lot of research that involves the Baltimore Sun. Too. Uh, but, you know. They didn't make it easy to give them no. money. And I feel like in this climate, you should probably. Well, I mean, like, uh, and, and newspapers are a perfectly good example of what we're dealing with, with, with uh, the hospitals, too. Because yeah. I, I should anyone who works a full time job be struggling to pay rent? No, I, you know, like, I, I feel like we should we should all be reasonable here to, uh, you know, if you cut a billion dollars off of Bezos's top. Right. Yeah. Like just a billion dollars fell out of his pocket. And it was distributed amongst other people who lived in L.A. Yeah. And, you know, the what are we at? Like 10 million people in L.A. The basin. Yeah. yeah. In the L.A. County. Yeah. Orange I County mean, like area. that's yeah. not that's not large money. But yeah. I mean, like hypothetically, you know, like little tiny investments and in things that it can prove and if five dollars worth of investment in somebody's life can make profound impacts on the other side. Wait, so I have a proposition for you, Corey. Yeah. So. 
I think the state or maybe the federal government should step in, take a little bit of money from really rich people and then fund programs that benefit large groups of people. <laughs> oh, it sounds like communism you're speaking of. <laughs> the, uh, or, you know, just taxation. Yeah. That's you keep well, no, fighting. No, these no, 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 Republicans. no, no, no. Hold on here. Here's here's the real problem. Uh at it the end, communism, of, at the end of the day, we think we think that uh, you know how much it costs. If if I keeled over with a heart attack right now and I had to pay cash for all my expenditures at the hospital, yeah, it would be ninety seven thousand dollars or something like that, you know, or more. Uh, your bigger I'm, problem is I don't call the cops, so you better hope somebody watching the <laughs> show is going to make a call for you. <laughs> Just going to dump me off the balcony and hope somebody calls. Push you out in the <laughs> hallway. The, uh, Somebody will take care of that. It's fine. <laughs> People walking by with that mask. I'm like, <laughs> no, excuse me. me. Excuse me. Uh, Put your mask on, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and then call the police. Uh, call the ambulance. Uh, no, I mean, like, people, you know, it, it would cost me $97,000 if I went to the hospital with a heart attack. Yeah. Uh, you, you imagine that of that $97,000 that, you know, 20% of it is going towards staff. I mean, like, if if I was running a restaurant and I had 20% payroll cost, that's more or less yeah, what I, you are, know, right? that's that's pretty even with what I should be paying. Uh, you know, uh, discerning minds would say you got to keep it below 18%, but, you know, there's a little fluctuation in that number from well, time question, to time. Do you serve breakfast or not? Do you have three <laughs> shifts or two? That's the... Yeah, there's, there's different things at play here, but... Uh, you, you would think that, you know, somebody who's working as an emergency room nurse is making really great money. And some yep. of them are some some nurses and some doctors make really great money. Yep. Other people don't make any money at all. And the problem is that the hospital is more interested in charging fifteen dollars per band aid. Yeah. And getting insurance to cover it than to pay the people who work to put the band aids on. Yep. Uh, and it's more important if they can if they can show a direct cause of of price like I don't know what to tell you every single time we put a band aid on it costs twenty bucks that the insurance company has to go well, all right yeah <laughs> here's that twenty like they don't care about the they'll pay the twenty all day but if you say that you got to pay twenty dollars an hour to the person who put the band aid on as well not made of money what <laughs> what is this yeah so I mean like you know it, it, it's a complex series of corporations that are running healthcare both in the hospital side and on the insurance side so and it's it, it, all these things are just complicated you know when, when capitalism gets involved in what should be basic human rights it becomes complicated to discern what dollar amount should be spent where but, but. assuming that we were not going to have a big communist uprising which you know we should uh how about this this is what i'm proposing and why i wanted to bring it up okay I propose that once we are free and clear of coronavirus, wherever, whenever that is, yeah. um, because I don't want something to be done during the crisis that then is undone when the crisis is over. This is a, we are out, we're clear. Now we're going to take decisive action that we push Congress to pass a true heroes act that essentially says what Franklin Roosevelt said in 1932, a living wage for a day's work. If you work 40 hours a week at a job, you should be able to afford housing and food. You should be able to live in the area yeah. in which you are earning that 40 hours of work. And we don't do it. And I, I know Republicans hate this, so you're probably going to hate it. But we do it as a benefit, as a way to say thank you to everyone who, by the way, the people who stocked the shelves while we were in uh, under quarantine we're making seven, well, not in California, but nationwide, seven twenty-five an hour. They're making minimum wage, which in California now is what thirteen twenty-five an hour. Yeah, you still can't afford an apartment in LA on thirteen twenty-five an hour. I think I think a lot of the problem is because uh, uh, I think we specifically have seen this over the course of our lifetimes how the value of the dollar has exploded so much you know well it, the devalue well devalue yes. yeah but i'm yeah. saying like the 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 cost of things has exploded while the the amount of money you make for an honest day's work is is stagnant you know but first and i think first that, can, first tank of gas i bought what about 89 cents I, per something gallon. like that yeah, yeah like 95 cents and minimum wage when i was working a minimum wage job, which job to pay for that 89 cents a gallon gas mm -hmm. 725 yeah today 
Gas nationwide, best you're going to do, probably 170 so up yeah. by a dollar. Mm-hmm. Minimum wage, 725 Yeah. Nothing has improved. The The problem is that we, we, we don't... Uh, uh, I, I I honestly think that a lot of people aren't coming from it from a place of like wanting to be cruel to people. I mm-hmm. think generally people want a living wage for for work and stuff like that. But I think about it sometimes from the perspective of my dad, where he talks about stories about like my first job is the good humor ice cream man. I got made a dollar twenty an hour or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And then when you look at it, it's like that would have been equivalent to twenty five dollars an hour nowadays. A steak dinner cost you. <laughs> 25 cents when you were making a buck 25 an hour right and yeah. you know like there's a lot of other things but like it's hard for you to shake like that, you know like yeah. oh at one point i made a dollar an hour and you know like i i was fine and like you know now they're making 15 dollars an hour and you know like i'm sure expenses have gone up a little bit but it's hard to <laughs> if you're not out there constantly like having to rent a new place or yeah. like you know it, it, get new insurance or you know get a new cell phone plan or whatever whatever little cost of life you need to you need to spend on then you don't know what it's like yep. like you know my dad has paid the same mortgage for 25 years you know or more so to him we're still stuck at you know 1990 price on yep. <laughs> on, on his home well it's uh, one of the things i love about iowa and new hampshire which they don't do anymore but they should it used to be that that's where you would get the thing the questions like how much is a gallon of milk yeah and then you get all of the candidates to be like uh dollar 10 like <laughs> Whoa, this guy's way out of touch. Yeah. And he'd be like, I don't know, $15? Like, <laughs> what? Yeah, it's because it lets you know how in tune your leader is going to be with the reality of life. Yeah. When's the last time you, sir, bought a gallon of milk or a gallon of gas or bread for yeah. anything? Um, but you heard it here first. I am calling for the, uh, the post-coronavirus Heroes Act where we call for a living wage for a, a living for work. Whatever you will make for 40 hours, you have to be able to live on that wage. If you are going to be working for you. The problem is that if you don't have people, and th- this is always my concern about this type of issue mm-hmm. is if you don't have somebody who is fighting for the rights of the people who are, you know, at the lower end who are getting, getting shafted here, then it's just going to cause prices to go up. You're going you would pay a nurse twenty five dollars an hour mm-hmm. instead of fifteen to do their job, and now they can live comfortably, like not so that they can pay their rent in L A. or something like yeah. that. But then all of a sudden, rent is going to go up because more people have more money, and there's going to be more, you know, costs that are associated with people having more money. Uh, that the hospital is going to charge way more than they uh, have before to you know, take the new cost of the raises that you're giving to these employees. And now you're going to hurt somebody who doesn't have insurance and got hit by a car. And now they're at the hospital and their hundred thousand dollar procedure is now $150,000. Super strange because the rules of capitalism are governed by an invisible hand supply Mm -hmm. and demand. Yeah. And through the last three months, demand has gone up exponentially. Supply has gone down exponentially. And yet, Prices are relatively stable in the store. Why is that? Because the means of being able to get a lot of these products to market is still out there. The infrastructure is still out there. And the states have said you cannot take advantage of this economic time. So if you, I can't, uh, pr- price, you can't price gouge. Yeah. And if we are willing to do it now, why aren't we willing to do it on a, much larger basis to just say we are in a crisis right now of morality in the country and we well, need to address that. I mean, uh, it, it would, it would help if there was just more people who brought up, like if you thought, if you thought about uh, your paycheck as what you're paying, the various different departments of, of government, yeah. right? Like <laughs> I make a hundred dollars a week, just round number, round number. make a hundred dollars a week. You know, 85 percent of that, 85 cents of that is or 85 dollars of that is going to police. Mm -hmm. And then you're doing this thing of like, you know, like, oh, I'm giving 20 cents to help people get get homes. And, you know, here's another 30 cents for the homeless. And here's uh, 70 cents for the schools. That sounds fair. Like you're you're breaking off the rest of it in little tiny incremental pieces. Yeah. 
n- you had to have somebody sort of bring it up first. I feel like if there was somebody who was like, hey, I worked as a sales rep for Pfizer and I met all the heads of all the major hospitals and here's how much everything gets spent. On. Here's how much uh, everything gets spent. Here's how the, the sausage is made. Enjoy yourself. And then you look at it and you say like, holy shit, staff cost is 0.2% of the, you know, like you, you do the, you know, and it, it, a lot of the problem with capitalism too, is that at a certain point you devalue a person based off of what type of work they do mm-hmm. and not like whether or not they should be valued as a person just in general. Like how much is the value of a person working? Yeah. Uh, because they'll say like, you know, oh, this woman who is filing and, you know, typing up reports because we need to send the insurance reports. We wouldn't have hired her if it wasn't for the insurance company. So she's making money off of that. And therefore, she only needs to make seven dollars an hour. Like, it's just all she's doing is typing. You know, like those are the types of arguments we need to. I your quick little aside, by the way, is <laughs> yes. gone horribly right. And I will uh, I will say that I'm going to dedicate myself over the next the rest of 2020 to doing exactly what you asked for right there. To expose hospitals. I am hospitals. going to not expose hospitals. I'm going to educate people as much as they want to listen on how the sausage is made. So this is what your money goes to. Uh, you know, I've talked about bringing back Rob Explains Everything. I'm going to start out with either systemic racism or defunding the police. I'm going to move on from there to say, what is the actual cost of giving a living wage? What are the impacts? Rent going up, prices going up, everything else. We're going to dive in. We'll do a deep dive for the rest of 2020. Uh, the other news, uh, lightning round article was, uh, there's going to be our, uh, Biden said three debates. Yeah. We haven't heard from Trump. Uh, my guess is going to be less because, uh, I feel like they agreed to three though. I think Biden's campaign just put out three and we haven't heard a response about a yes or no. Uh, I mean, Trump said to some extent that he's looking forward to a debate when yes. he went, when he was on Tulsa. So he said he was looking forward to a debate. I don't know if he's going to allow three cause I don't know. He sort of said, I think he said, uh, in sort of the New York way that he doesn't really articulate what he means. Yes. A He's like, debate. A debate. I'm looking forward to the debate with Biden. Like yeah. that, that the debate could mean 15 debates. It could be one debate. It could be, you know, we'll the, the debate in the general or debate in the microcosm of the event. <laughs> like, you know, and we will, uh, talk about the, uh, that rally briefly before we do that though. I promised you a coronavirus update. So, of course, here is your coronavirus update. Two big pieces of news. One. We're fucked. Well, yeah. Uh, all right. Let me bring Corey back in real quick. Uh, <laughs> so, Corey has a big problem with people not wearing masks, and he absolutely should. You heard our example about winter clothes to go get the mail. Wear masks. Honestly, like, who cares? It's not, you know, it's not even the... I, I want everyone to wear a mask, yeah. but at the same time, can, like... I, I get why people say like, oh, I don't need to put it in. I'm just walking down the hall to get to go to the trash or something like yeah. that. But you don't know if you're going to run into somebody in the hall who has an awful cough or doesn't have an awful cough. You don't even know. Yep. We got out of the out of the car when we got here and there were people without masks standing around their car and I could smell that they were smoking weed. Yeah. And they started coughing and I assumed it was because of that. Yeah. But I don't know. Who knows? And now I'm just feeling uncomfortable walking by all these people coughing with no masks on. Why not both? It could be both. You never know. It could be both. And, uh, you know, it's just like, to me, I would feel so awful if I got somebody sick. Mm -hmm. If it, even if it was a normal, healthy person who got better two weeks later, I wouldn't feel awful like, you know, sue me or something like that. But I feel awful in the general way that like, you know, if you got anybody sick, you'd feel, you'd feel terrible about when you it. You get the flu like, and then somebody, you know, gets it and you're yeah, like, Oh, that's probably I gave me. it to you. Yeah, ah, sorry about that. I know how terrible this is. Yeah. So. yeah. And this is way worse than the flu. So yeah. I, I, I just, to me, it seems so easy and it seems like, uh, uh, I'm a, I don't know anything. I'm an idiot. So why, why should I question? Like, this seems like, at the very least, it's not hurting. Like, is that is that a reasonable? Absolutely. <laughs> and I was going to say, to record for posterity, so this will live forever, uh, Corey disconnected his mobile data on the way here and then couldn't figure <laughs> out why he couldn't make a phone call. And this guy knows could, to wear a mask, all right? Come I could, on. I could make a phone call. I couldn't get Google to work. Oh, that's like, what it was. Yeah, I couldn't get Google to work. Uh, so... Your coronavirus update for this week. Two things. Good news, bad news. Uh, Let's start with the bad news. Uh, Cases are spiking on the way up. 
Um, we are about two weeks out from the start of the George Floyd protests, which, by the way, are ongoing. As much as you're not seeing it on the news, they're still happening. It's still going on. And good for that. But mask up, wear some gloves, stay social distancing because we need to do that. And what the CDC is essentially saying now is we didn't stop. We didn't come down off the peak. We are still on our way up on the upside of the peak. And it just like global warming, the temperature goes up and down, but we're trending upwards still. And we need to get to the other side of this thing. And luckily we're treating it with, with a lot of respect. Oh wait, no, we are yeah. reopening the entire economy. And as excited as I am to get a movie, <laughs> I, Still, eh, we shouldn't be. We should be closing things down because it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, but good news on this topic. Uh, some uh, there, a, there was a study that was done, I want to say it was in the UK, uh, where they isolated the genetic, this specific genetic strain, the uh, COVID-19, uh, coronavirus, no, uh, the novel coronavirus 19. They have identified some DNA and RNA strands, which is a huge step forward in getting a permanent vaccine. Because part of the part of the things we're worried about is that we get a vaccine for this, and then it mutates slightly, and the vaccine doesn't work. But when you have an RNA or a DNA based vaccine, then that means it can mutate all its all at once because your DNA remains the same, the DNA of the virus remains the same, and the vaccine will continue to work. So we're basically looking at a two-step solution, one of which is vaccine as many people as possible with um, the tracker, so I know where the fuck you are because you're all dumb. I'm just kidding. There's no trackers. Nobody gives a <laughs> shit. Uh, but no, vaccine So Bill is, Gates can keep an eye on you and yeah. Redmond? Uh, vaccine as many people as possible. Like he wants to know where, where all you dumb shits go? <laughs> Strip club again. God, his life. God. I don't even... But uh, yeah, so there's going to be two Bill steps. Bill Gates like, you know how long it's been since I've been to a strip club? Forever. Yeah. I can't go. I can't go. I get mobbed. Well, one guy's a billionaire. <laughs> one guy's broke. I wonder what the difference is. Uh, but uh, yeah, there'll, all, be two, there'll be two steps. There will be a temporary vaccine. All which the strippers is, come over to me and nobody else. So awful you? for everyone else. Wouldn't you? <laughs> God, if Bill Gates walks into a strip club, it's just like all the... Gr- Girls in the middle of like private dances, like bye. <laughs> Throwing money back, like yeah, you can have it. Anyway, I, I'm trying to lightning round this. And Corey's trying his best. So uh, essentially, there'll be two steps. It will be a temp- not a temporary vaccine, but a vaccine that is based on the the virus and our studies of the virus, and then hopefully later on there will be a RNA DNA vaccine, which will be more akin to polio or smallpox where we can eradicate it and we won't have to worry about it. This particular novel virus anymore, just in time for nature to bring up coronavirus 20. <laughs> yeah. Um, the sequel, the sequel. So, uh, yeah, so that's your coronavirus update. Uh, and we'll be back next week with more updates, but, uh, wear a mask and stay inside if you can. <laughs> and just generally, like, uh, I feel like LA too, we were so good for a little while there. Like nobody was leaving their house and I would look out and I'd see like no traffic for yep. the most part. And I'd be like, wow, we, we really are doing well. And then it seemed like, uh, they, they left the door open a little bit and they're just like, all right, I guess you can go outside and play a little. And then boom, just ev- everywhere, like out. everyone went out. Nobody's gro- uh, obeying any rules. Uh, and you know, the other, pre- you know, we're talking about like, we talked about the cops there and their rules and regulations and stuff too. Gert, uh, uh, Newsom put out a mask mandate. Yeah. Like you have to wear a mask if you're outside and you, you can't be physically distanced and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and what should just be him trying his best to get this out there without having to declare martial law has been met with like, what fucking gives you the right King Newsome? And like, how dare you say we have to wear a mask? And it's just like, he's not doing this to, you know, it's not like he said like your first burnt daughter comes to me or something like that. It's like, he said, please wear a mask. I'm demanding that everyone please wear a mask. (sighs) I don't understand people. I I honestly don't. And the tweet of the week this week again was something along the lines of like, Oh, so we got bored and coronavirus is over. Okay, cool. That cause (laughs) no, (laughs) Sorry, Google. Uh, no evidence to suggest that we're in any better shape than we were three weeks ago or three months ago, but we just got bored and we got tired of being inside. So let's loosen everything up. Well, not only that, but it looks like, uh, you know, like the when New York got hit, we started getting cases in L.A. They kept saying, like, we're two weeks behind New York. Yeah. I don't like two weeks behind. We shut it down. Like, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we not be experiencing this in two weeks if we're all home now? I mean, should have. We should have. Yes. But, 
meanwhile, in other places, like, you know, across the South and in Arizona and Texas and Florida and stuff like that, they were just like, fuck the rules. Everyone go. Everyone do their thing. There's no coronavirus here. And then all of a sudden it, it runs rampant on them. So it's like they were probably a month or two behind mm-hmm. L.A. essentially. Like it took a while for it to spread and to them. Of- but now they're getting hit way worse than. And Arizona is getting hurt worse than New York per capita, I think. Like, and no one is shutting back down. They're all just yeah. like, we're going to push through this. And I'm like, oh, okay. What I, was it for? I, I wonder if, I, I, to the end of this, I feel like the uh, corporate interests are at hand where they think, like, we're not going to get sued. Yep. Like, everyone's just going to assume that if you get sick at work, it's just because everyone's getting sick. And they're not going to sue us for unsafe conditions that led to them getting sick. So let's let it roll. No one's going to plausible deniability like jobs closed because everything else closed. And you were like, only place I've been is work at home. So if I'm sick, I got it from work. Yeah. But now that everything's open, it's like, well, listen, did you get it from work? Or did you get it from the grocery store or the movie theater or the barbershop? Where'd you get it? We can't say it's from work. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and everybody's got plausible deniability. So let's reopen everything. Well, no, I mean, like nobody, the, I think the other problem was that there, there wasn't really, I feel like everyone wanted to keep things going. Like, People who worked at supermarkets didn't want to feel like bad guys if they yeah. put up a fight against something. So, you know, the reasonable standards of wear masks, wear gloves, wash hands regularly. You know, we're going to do temperature checks like that Major all stations. seemed like the the uh, that seems like enough to make people feel safe. Yeah. And like they sh- didn't have to push anything more. But perhaps, uh, you know, some of the essential workers who got drafted into working, even though you know, their, their essentialness can be questioned to some degree. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I don't mean essential, like they're not essential, you know, members of society, but like, you know, if you were saying like, everything's going, going to die, who, who needs to go to work? Like it's nuclear war. Who's going to work still? I don't. Like, yeah. <laughs> half the people who are going. Yeah. Now, some people might think the dispensary workers are absolutely essential, <laughs> but for me, I'd just be like, maybe those guys should stay home. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe maybe not everyone is essential, you know, but the I, I don't know. I, I just I just feel like at some point there's there's a corporate interest who's saying we're not going to get sued. So yep. let's just roll with it. And as soon as we hit that point, it's goodbye. I yeah. mean, that's what we're doing now. Everybody's just like, all right, well, let's reopen and call it. So yeah. uh, we should be OK with four hundred thousand dead because that's probably where we're headed now. They were saying when this started, one hundred thousand dead by August. We hit that in May. Yeah. So we are now not out of the realm of possibility of hitting half a million dead well, from coronavirus. Also, 25% of, I can't remember if it was the total cases or the deaths, but 25% is uh, in the U.S. Yep. And there is, uh, <laughs> the U.S. is not 25% of the world's population. We are, we are getting it's 100%. hit. 100%. It's the only one that matters. <laughs> we course. are getting hit way worse than anyone else. Uh, now, granted, I, I uh, getting into Trump here for a second. I, I understand that uh, uh, China might not be reporting all their numbers accurately, and uh, that's something we've come used to with China. Uh, but that is no excuse for you to try and do the same and limit the number of tests. Yeah, uh, as he as he so stated in his rally in front of a middling group of people, uh, <laughs> there was a. Uh, he, he argued that uh, part of the reason we were in this trouble was because we're testing too much. And he told his people to slow the test down. Now, later, uh, people said uh, he was joking. That was a joke, obviously. Obviously. Uh, but then when Trump was asked about whether or not it was a joke, he kind of danced around. <laughs> so it's always, you can't just be like, yeah, of course it's a joke. Why don't uh, Anywho, Trump had his rally in Tulsa. Uh, a million people, apparently. More than a million people said they were going to be there. And... Uh, <laughs> According to the Tulsa Fire Department, uh, Fire Marshal, uh, 6,200 people showed up to the 19,000-seat arena. Uh, Trump apparently had Air Force One do like a low pass over the arena uh, so he could mire the crowds outside. And when he saw no crowds outside, they tore down the outside (laughs) event structure because they were going to give a speech outside and then inside. It was going to be Pence and Trump outside and then inside. And they're going to do two shows. Uh but, I mean, Trump was essentially working out new stand-up material yeah. in front of everybody. He's getting ready for 2020, so he's uh, he's just working his new stuff. This out. is what he does. He goes out. He, he works on his new stand-up material. He he, uh, he does his thing to own the libs, and then, you know, that's... 
couple of the greatest hits when you hit like, <laughs> a lull and you got to just get a little punchy laugh and you hit the greatest hits and go back to the new stuff. I, what bothers me, and I mean, this shouldn't be surprising because it's been happening for as long as Trump has been alive, but uh, what bothers me is that he'll he'll say things that are in such poor taste for no other reason than to rile up idiots and <laughs> make make people who don't agree with him like vigorously like shake their head in disgust. He uh this one didn't seem to pick up as much as others uh other things he said during the the speech, but I tweeted about it because it it bothered me. Uh he was make uh, the he was getting into defunding the police and like whether or not there's Democrats crazy Democrats are saying we should defund the police. I couldn't even believe it. Uh, and then he came up with an example and he's just like, well, I bet you want a police if you're, you know, if you're in your town and you're sleeping in your bed and I always use the example of the, the bad hombre, some bad hombre comes in, breaks into your house and kills you. I bet you want the police then. And I was just like, yeah, except for that's exactly what happened for Brianna Taylor and she's dead. So maybe she wouldn't want the police to come into uh, her house. Yeah, while the she's- bad hombres then yeah. were the police. That's what <laughs> yeah. happened. Yeah. And, and uh. that said example, the bad hombres were the police. So, uh, maybe we don't need them, but, uh, hmm. <laughs> it just bothers <laughs> Like if he's talking about like OJ Simpson, it's just like. Don't you hate it when you murder your wife, your ex-wife and their boyfriend and or the guy from the restaurant? Yeah. Yeah. Eh, maybe, maybe a boyfriend, friend, whatever he was. Yeah. And it was like, yes. Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> Speaking to a party of one. All right. <laughs> the the uh, I, I, I'm glad that uh, not as many people went to this thing yeah. as as. I was I was really worried that this thing was going to be fucking packed with idiots, but I think that uh, calmer heads prevailed, and a lot of people were like, "I don't want to go there." I, I I think people probably made that decision during the hours of pre-show coverage that this was getting on all the major news channels. Yeah. Like, yeah, I was uh, so you know Rachel and I were just like you know cleaning and doing odds and ends, so we put on CNN just to have it in the background. And, uh, you know, it's four hours, five hours before the thing starts. And you can see on the floor, you know, just huge groups of white people just all gr- bumped together. Yep. No mass, no anything. Yep. Uh, you know, it's scattered in the in the seats and stuff like that. But that was how it was the whole night. So <laughs> nothing much changed. But I, we both looked at it and we're just like. God, I wouldn't want to be there. there. There's no reason I'd want to be there. Like it, it just looks so dangerous for from the the Remember viral the, standpoint. The South Korean church where one guy infected 500 people. Yeah. Like that's that's what you're looking at. Well, I feel the same. Like the, you know, we talked about the the birthday party in Pasadena or something like that. Yeah. Like that first big week of coronavirus in California. Like one person went there, they were sick, and they got like 16 people sick. And probably and, somebody at that rally joked about, "Oh, I, I probably have coronavirus," yeah. and they did, and they infected a bunch of people. Well, and the, the, you know, they, they were getting interviewed, like, aren't you worried about the coronavirus? And it's just like, I mean, I know people who've gotten sick and I've known people who died, but I don't think I'm going to get sick or die. And it's just like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we all hope. Yeah, like Funny thing. Everybody who died thought they weren't going to get sick and die. I, I mean, like I would, it would be wonderful if I did happen to get coronavirus, if it just pa- peacefully passed. Like it was just like. You know, I was I, I felt kind of crappy for a couple of days, uh-huh. but I stayed by myself. And then two weeks later, I got a negative test and I got another negative test. And now I'm good. All good. Yeah, I'm, I'm past it. I'm good. I, I, I would I would feel a little relieved at that moment that I'm past it. But going in with the prospect of catching it, I'm yeah. just like, God, I hope I don't die. <laughs> and I mean, like, I'm not in the the percentages that death is likely from coronavirus. But I don't know. I don't respiratory infection. Not great for, you know you well yeah but i mean like just in general too like i I always worry that like i'm gonna get some sort of like sometimes i get sick and i get really sick for like i don't get sick often but when i do it really hits me takes your legs out yeah Yeah, like uh, i'll get the flu every five years and it's way worse than anyone else's flu just because it's taken so long for me to get it they're they're paying up for all the time i missed you know (laughs) yeah i imagine coronavirus would have a similar feeling about it's like oh this this motherfucker (laughs) got him (laughs) here we go (laughs) Just see the one gazelle in the back of the pack, not God. keeping out <laughs> coronavirus. Like, ooh, motherfucker, you gonna get it? Uh, did you want to talk about uh, the other thing, the Bolton Bolton books? I mean, I I think that uh, 
know this, that Bolton's book is going to be released. Uh, he might still do jail time for releasing classified information, so we got that going for us. Maybe, yeah. Uh, all the money that he makes from said book might not go to him. It might go to the federal government if he's found uh, guilty of leaking classified state secrets. Mm, and still. Uh, and still, he releases it. I Something tells me that with the book coming out today, the day we release this podcast, there's going to be more news that is released tomorrow. Yeah. And I'd hate for us to start talking about all these salacious details we heard and, and then, then it's miss <laughs> out on the conversation that's happening for the rest of the week. So yeah, yeah. follow Twitter for quick takes, but uh, the we'll talk about it more next week. I imagine when we have yeah. a better sense of like the whole thing. Corey has dedicated himself to reading it cover to cover over the next week, and he'll have all the salacious details. As long as, as, long as I can steal it from somebody else. As long, I was going to say, as long as I can walk, Trump, there's a Trump book floating around here that needs to be read still, I think. The, right? the problem is that I need a, uh, I, I just don't want to give it money. I don't want to give. So people have been uh, randomly like posting like drive links to like yeah. the full text of it. And it, it goes so quickly. You can't even get it. Yeah. Uh, but you got to get it and download it. You got to click on it and download oh, it. Oh, I know. It. But I'm yeah. saying like by the time I actually see it posted, it's already like off. And I'm like, ah, uh, fuck. but, yeah. you know, I, I'm sure I'll find some sort of uh, I'll see somebody walking with it in their purse and I'll just yank it from. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need this. Marge shot. You're bad enough. <laughs> Another deep pull. No one born in the 2000s knows who that is. Uh, uh. Remember when you used to say that you had an affinity for Hitler and it would be the end of your career? <laughs> uh, whether or not you own a baseball team. Still. Uh, to, to be fair, it took two two whacks at that, at that tree to make it fall. But yeah. Yeah. She, she made Hitler comments and then she was suspended for a year. Where she still went to all the games and she was still like involved. She's in a fan. Like, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, they ran, a, they ran another Sports Illustrated piece where it's just like, so I bet you feel really bad about those Hitler comments. It's like, no, nope. not really. I think he's a pretty good guy. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> and then said things that all notable races say, like, yeah, he gets a lot of got a lot of bad rap for all the bad things he did. And I'm not saying the killing of the Jews is good, but you know, he built roads. What about the There's economy? Infrastructure. Germany was never better during that time. People were really happy with Germany. Like, I think he I went think, on something like make Germany great again, <laughs> and he really did. That's I'll tell you what. People yeah. want to focus on the man's flaws. <laughs> and I just want to say that not every person is as bad of a person as you make them out to be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. was all Mark Schatz. Yeah, that wasn't Corey. <laughs> that wasn't me. Though. Although I'd like to take that out of context somehow. Uh. God knows when uh, <laughs> I'm about to. It's the last day of Oscar voting, and they're going to be like Corey's controversial remarks on Hitler. And then just all the Marge shot parts just get. <laughs> there's just a blank anytime I say Marge shot. The dot, dot, dot. If Hitler has some pretty good ideas. <laughs> if you listen to this in the future, hit me up. I'll edit it for you. It'll be great. Uh <laughs> As long as you point people to the website. Yes. You, can, you take the take the video, put it on CNN, just say go to otheanthem.com for more. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, <laughs> wait, which website would we point people to, Corey? Uh, probably otheanthem.com. Corey to otheanthem.com. Otheanthem on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the listener line, 443-219-7595. What's that number again? 443-219-7595. You can find more of me at my website, CoreyBakerFilmmaker.com, Facebook.com forward slash CoreyBakerFilm, and at LegendCB5 on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Uh, I have a review that is ready to go out for 7,500, 75, uh, 7,500. I don't know exactly how we're talking about this movie, but uh, it's going to be out there. It's an Amazon original, so everyone who has Amazon Prime can go see it right now. And uh, yeah, that's about it for me. All right. And uh, of course, you can find more of me at Robert and Cheek on all your social networks. That's uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Snapchat, TikTok, Tumblr, everywhere, at Robert N. Cheek. Uh, make sure you check out robertncheek.com, where you can find links to all the videos that I do. That's at youtube.com forward slash Rob Cheek. Uh, Every Man Movie Review, doing two episodes a week. Uh, the last one we have up is uh, The Gentleman. Nope. Uh, I Love You Now Die. Those are the last two, The Gentleman and I Love You Now Die. And I have a special series coming forward for the next four episodes where... I meandered through Apple TV, and although they don't have any original movies, they do have some original series. So for the first time, I'm going to do a series review about four of uh, the series that drew me to Apple TV and whether or not you should check those out. So that's available at uh, youtube.com forward slash Rob Cheek, along with uh, some other stuff like The Return of Rob Explains Everything. I'm looking to do that this uh, week. 
as a radio show mm. on Spoon. So if you don't have Spoon, you should download it. Come and find me at Robert and Cheek. And we'll be doing Rob Explains Everything, the radio show this weekend. Uh, it'll also be on YouTube, but check it out on Spoon in its pure format. You'll be able to call in. You'll be able to send me messages, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and of course, uh, everything about me is there on the website, including the books, which are available on Amazon. Buy Rob's books. And we have so much exciting stuff coming. Uh, not just uh, the books, not just all of that, but O oh, the Anthem stuff. In fact, we're going to get off here, we're going to break down, and we're doing our two-week check-in on a four-week project to bring you mm -hmm. a ton of brand new stuff for the rest of 2020. Before we do that, though, I'm going to have to uh, rid myself of the sweat that I've just been billowing inside of while the yeah. the air has been off I was gonna, listen all this what, hot air is just causing i keep trying to lightning round it and <laughs> you it's like the tortoise and the hare and i just keep trying to hair it up and you're tortoise yeah, it down. you're, you're over there going like hey let's have a lightning round and i'm like hey remember scary movie <laughs> how about marge shot anything else random i can pull out oj simpson how about that yeah, lucky for me i cut the hair i'm nice and cool uh cool calm and collected it's just, it's just billowing inside the rat's nest right now yeah I, i'm i'm relaxing in my very chill pair of thieves mm. boxer shorts it's lovely a pair of thieves <laughs> they're not our sponsor but they could be Hit us up. <laughs> anyway well i think we've done good here today <laughs> up until that last part <laughs> we've done something i don't know if it's good but as always, you're listening to the O the Anthem podcast, part of the O the Anthem digital network. For for Corey, this is Rob. Have a great week, everybody. Send air, please. <laughs> How the fuck is it 72 degrees in here? <laughs> <laughs>